So uh, last class we looked at two fallacies that weren't in any particular families. And these are kind of similar. And these, there's problems um, either with the, the way in which it's, it's organized, some, some assumption that's going on, or with the, with the begging the question to some degree of the structure. Um, and I think that you guys may have become accustomed to hearing this term begging the question. Somebody's begging a, a particular question. And it gets misused a little bit in our contemporary culture, so I'm going to clue you into that. But before that, we're going to talk about uh, misplacing the burden of proof and a fallacy that goes along with it. Your book doesn't um, do a very good job of, of highlighting the name of this fallacy, but the name is actually the appeal to ignorance. <laughs> And that has to do with misplacing the burden of proof. Sometimes it's also called the argument from ignorance um, or the argument, argumentum ad, ad ignorantium, um, which actually would be literally the argument to ignorance. But in any case, um, in order to make sense of this, we have to understand this concept of the burden of proof. So, I, and that's a concept I think you guys are familiar with too. When you say that the burden of proof lies on somebody, what do you mean? Yeah, if you have two sides, and um, one is already the established side, one is already the uh, side that the majority of the people accept, that's been around for a long time, if you want to go against that, it's up to you to make the case. Um, same thing if there's you know, authorities in place. When you were a kid and you thought that something was going to be a good idea for you to buy, like say candy or a new toy or things like that, you know, your parents might have said, yeah, yeah, shut up, you know, quit bugging me, here's some money, go buy it, right? There, there wasn't any, any actual argument, but your parents might have also said, well, yeah, I'll consider buying it, why should I? Well, what they're doing there is they're saying the burden of proof is on you to make the case why you ought to have that particular candy. Well, this candy is in the form of a whistle. It'll be two, two things in one. So it'll be sweet, and I'll get to, you know, make a lot of racket. I mean, parents might not buy it for you just for that particular reason, right? Um, same thing when it comes to controversial issues. Um, now, it could be that there's the, the default position, the position that we ought to be in, is one that's not committed to either side. Um, if you think about it when it comes to political issues, I would be willing to bet that most of you line up on, on one side or the other. You're either fairly conservative or you're fairly liberal. Um, you either support the Republican Party or you support the Democratic Party. Um, and, it, you know, there may be some, some inconsistencies or contradictions there. Um, if you're actually say, conservative on things like abortion and you're supporting the Democratic Party, eh, you got a, you got a problem there, right? Um, or if you're pretty liberal on, say, gay rights and you're supporting the, the Republican Party, eh, you got a problem there too, right? But for the most part, most people have some sort of leaning. Now, what does that mean? That means that one side, at least with you, and people that you associate with that, that see things the way you do, one side already can count on you believing them. They don't have to meet the burden of proof. The other side, you are, you are very um, likely to demand a higher, you know, higher degree of certainty, stronger arguments before you're going to listen to their positions. So if you're already strongly anti-abortion, um, if somebody wants to make the case that abortion should be legal, um, then you're going to demand more proof of them than you will uh, on the other side. Where are we as a nation? Do we have one leaning or the other? It's, you know, it's, it's more or less 50-50, isn't yeah. it? The last elections um, have been pretty close. Obama actually did pretty good with the electoral votes this last election. When it came to the popular vote, he didn't actually, you know, he didn't do the grand slam. Um, and it didn't really have to do quite so much with, with him. It has to do with these, these uh, platforms. 
there, there are some fairly opposed ways of seeing things, you know, the liberals and, and conservatives. But there's a whole bunch of people in the middle, like me. And it's up to both of those sides, if they want somebody like me to vote for them, it's up to them to make the case. So if you're saying somebody else has to meet a burden of proof, that means it's up to them to make the case. Um, think about our jury system, our, our trial system. Who does the burden of proof fall on? The defense? Prosecution. Prosecution. You're innocent until proven guilty, right? Um, what that means is you have what's called a presumption of innocence. That means that the burden of proof, burden of proof, the burden of proof is on the other side. Uh, now, if you if you are talking with the prosecutor before the trial. You know, most cases don't actually go to trial. Um, there, you're not walking in with the same innocent until proven guilty, because that prosecutor has you in his office or her office. Why? Because they think you're guilty, right? So you, they're, they're already presuming that you are. And if you want them to drop the charges, who's it up to to make that case? You. Yeah, it's, well, you or your defense attorney, right? Um, or it could be your parents if you're... Uh, underage. Um, but once you actually go into that courtroom, the way our jury system works, and the way it works in England and other countries whose laws are descended from English common law, is the burden of proof lies on the prosecutor. And if they don't meet that, then the person goes free. Um, it's kind of interesting. You know, in Scotland, they actually have three different verdicts. We have, we have two, right? Innocent, guilty. The Scots actually have a third verdict, which is um, not proven guilty. And they give this to people where um, they think they actually are guilty, but the burden of proof just hasn't been met. You know, they, they're not saying the person is innocent. They're not clearing him entirely or her entirely. But they're saying, yeah, we just haven't met the burden of proof. Uh, it's the same way with, with um, theories. If you bring forth a new scientific theory, burden of proof is on you, right? Um, if you want to change things, for instance, a long time ago, uh, there was a guy named Louis Pasteur. Does anyone remember? I brought this up a couple of classes ago, what, what this guy was responsible for. Yeah. Uh, wasn't, <clears throat> wasn't he like some scientist? Mm -hmm. He's a French guy, French scientist. Um, what, did, what did he, um, not necessarily come up with, but, but prove to be correct? I'll give you a hint. Uh, this is kind of related to it. Pasteurized milk, pasteurized things come from Louis Pasteur. What's up? Cheese. Um, he, proved, he proved cheese. Cheese isn't really something you prove, you know, is it? <laughs> Cheese is often made, made with pasteurized milk. Um, well, I mean, he's right. I mean, you use pasteurized milk. What is pasteurization? Do any of you know what it, what it is offhand? Any of you ever been to a dairy farm or anything like that? You should go. Big operations, interesting stuff. They take the milk and they, they heat it uh, very quickly to <coughs> very high temperature and then they bring it back down again. What are they trying to kill? Germ bacteria. Bacteria, right. Now, up until the time of Louis Pasteur and doing his experiments, uh, a lot of people, the scientific establishment, believed that it wasn't germs, it wasn't these little cells that they could observe through the microscope that caused disease, it was other things. And Louis Pasteur said, no, I think it's, I think it's this, but it was up to him to make the case, and, and he did it successfully. Um, the atom bomb, there were a lot of people who thought, no, you can't split the atom, because you know what the word atom actually means? Can't split. That comes from Greek, ah, you know, not, uh, and then uh, ten name means to, to cut. So an atom is the smallest unit. Turns out it's actually not, right? As you remember from your high school uh, chemistry and physics. Um, but it was up to the people who claimed that you could to make the case, to show that it could be done. Um, now, where does the argument from ignorance come in? It comes from misplacing the burden of proof. And here's how it works. If you say something like this, um, 
haven't proven, or could be you don't know. <coughs> X to be the case. That's the, the uh, starting point. Therefore, X is not the case. And you can do this positively or you can do it negatively. <coughs> If you haven't, or you haven't proven, or you don't know something to be the case, therefore the opposite is actually true. And you know that that's the case. So, let's take an example. Because, um, well, let's see, we started out with about 25 students in the semester, and uh, we're down to about 20 or so, 18. Um, what happened to those other students? Well, they probably were taken by the CIA. That's, that's why I think my, my enrollment is down in this class. You said CIA? Yeah, or, or you know, we'll make it the FBI. Anybody you like, right? Okay. Uh, just using this as an example. Um, so, you haven't proven that that's not the case, right? I mean, you don't know whether they, the CIA took them or not. You haven't tracked those students down. So, it is the case. Well, there's something wrong there, isn't there? Yeah. What's, so what's wrong there? Well, there's an assumption being made that um, it has to do with the burden of proof that the burden of proof is on you. If I want to make claims about the CIA or the FBI or any other um, <coughs> organization like that, I should have to prove it, shouldn't I? I mean, otherwise I can say anything I like, you know? Aliens are coming next week. Uh, actually, all of you do have to show up uh, for, for uh, class when I'm away at a conference because an alien professor will come here. You haven't proven it's not true, right? So you better show up. Well, again, you know, if I'm going to make far-fetched claims, burden of proof is on me. Uh, people do this with all sorts of things. They'll say, well, you know, nobody's actually proven that ghosts don't exist, so they exist, right? Um, nobody's proven that, think about conspiracy theories. Um, what are some conspiracy theories that, that you can think of? Your book, you know, always talks about the JFK conspiracy theory, but... That's what I was going to say. Yeah, I mean, most people are, especially, you know, uh, people in the upcoming generation, they're not interested in JFK. I mean, JFK died before, before I, was, I was even born. Um, but what are what are some other, some other contemporary conspiracy theories? What do people say? Yeah, there's there's a, a secret out there. Um, I was watching the National Geographic channel, and they were saying that the Nazis during World War II were making <clears throat> like brown aircraft, like the UFOs. Oh, okay. Yeah, UFOs are old Nazi aircraft, or you know, of course, you know, we we took all those Nazi scientists, right? So um, those those UFOs that we've seen, those must be uh, American aircraft. That's what they are. So UFOs are, are real. They're just uh, Air Force aircraft. Maybe you'll get to pilot one when you, when you go in. Right? Um, I, then somebody should say, well, where is your evidence? Where is your proof of that? And if I just say, well, you, know, you don't know that that's not the case, so it is the case, I'm committing the appeal to ignorance. Um, and, and people do this with all sorts of other conspiracy theories. Well, oftentimes what they'll do when they have a conspiracy theory is there'll be layer on layer of layer of argument and ignorance. Um, let's take another conspiracy theory. What's something else that people talk about besides, besides Tupac really being alive? Because that, that's, that's one that's out there, right? What's a bigger one than that? Elvis is still alive. Yeah, uh, besides, besides uh, celebrities being alive. Yeah, September 11th. What what are the uh, some of the conspiracy theories about that? It was planned. Right. 9/11 was an inside job carried out by the U.S. government in order to be able to make war on Islam, on the Arab states. You know, pick whatever you want in order to pass the Patriot Act, in order to uh, extend surveillance, all those sorts of things. Now, that's a fringe theory over here in the United States. 
That is actually a popular explanation for things in many countries worldwide. Uh, when um, when uh, polling companies have been going to some other countries and polling them to see what they actually think about this, there are some countries in which um, a large proportion of the people actually believe 9-11 was an inside job carried out by our government. Um, have any of you ever watched any of those um, shows or webcasts or things dealing with how 9-11 was actually an inside job? Any of those sort of things? Well, put that aside for, for a moment. Have any of you seen those? Okay. Um, very often, here's the logic behind it. They'll say one of two things. It'll be, here's a claim, you know, um, the, the planes, you know, couldn't have caused that damage. It had to be done by, by explosives internally, and, and here's why. You know, they'll give you something that looks fairly evidentiary, but then what happens if you question it? Um, yeah, sooner or later the, the proof gets displaced a while. And quite often when you're actually dealing with people like this who are, are buying into conspiracy theories, one of the things that they will end up resorting to is saying, oh, they got to you. That's why you believe it. You're, you're blinded by propaganda. And again, if they want to make claims like that, burden of proof is on them. Because it goes against, you know, think about where the, our burden of proof actually comes from. It comes from our background knowledge, which is generally reliable. It comes from experts that we, we trust who are generally reliable. You know, and we go with the mainstream of, of the experts, not just the fringe expert that we, we want to hear from. And I'll talk about some other ones like that in a moment. Um, that's where our, 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 uh, our um, understanding of who the burden of proof lies on comes from. Uh, what else do, do uh, people have conspiracy theories about? Well, you know, Easter's coming up. And what does that mean as far as TV goes? TV yeah, like on the Discovery Channel, the Learning Channel, <coughs> uh, probably ABC will have a special. They're going to have all sorts of specials, of, uh, and they're going to have some biblical scholars on there. And what they're not going to tell you is that most of these people that they're going to be interviewing are going to be, uh, they're going to have academic positions, and they're going to have written books, but they're going to be considered to be out of the mainstream. And they're gonna, there was actually an important find um, just recently. I don't know if any of you guys have been following this. They found these lead codices. A codex is a, is a book, you know, a little, little book. And these were supposed to revolutionize our understanding of early Christianity because these may be Christian writings earlier than the letters of St. Paul. And, you know, I've seen a lot of these things come up um, over, over the years because I, I taught religious studies. And I've developed a certain kind of skepticism towards these. I expect the burden of proof to be on those who are actually saying, yes, this is material that's going to totally change our view of, of early Christianity. Hey, if you want to make a claim like that, you've got to have some real evidence. You know, at first you've got to translate the stuff. You've got to actually put it out there publicly for other people to see. You've got to be sure the translations are actually good translations. Sometimes they're not. Um, and then you have to actually make a case why any of that's relevant to the two billion Christians in the world today. And is that what happens on these, you know, one hour, the real Jesus kind of specials? No, they put some person on and, and they say things like, well, we've got these source texts, these extra canonical gospels, and they might actually tell us this and this, and this. Therefore, this is the case. And then they don't actually even give you an opportunity to say, whoa, whoa, wait, wait a second. Where's your actual proof? Because it's a TV show. So you, you know, it's not interactive. Let's say it was interactive. They could just say, well, you know, you haven't proven that not to be the case, so we're going to assume that it is the case. And again, what is that? That's misplacing the burden of proof. Now, there are some things, this is the last point that I'm going to make about the argument from ignorance, there are some things that just cannot be decided in the ways that, that people often like to do. I'll give you one great example from theology or philosophy of religion. So here's the basic structure, right, of, of argument from ignorance. 
people will often bring up stuff uh, dealing with science, and they'll, they'll use it to try to prove that God exists or God doesn't exist. Um, and they'll say stuff like, um, science hasn't proven God exists, therefore what's the conclusion? God doesn't exist. Uh, you know, they'll say things like, there's no scientific evidence God exists, therefore God doesn't exist. You could just as well say science hasn't proven God doesn't exist. It's very hard to demonstrate a negative, isn't it? You know, prove to me that there wouldn't be three more people in this room if we had higher enrollment here at FSU. How would you go about that? I mean, demonstrating a negative is, is, is quite often uh, difficult. Okay. Science hasn't proven God exists, therefore God doesn't exist. Science hasn't proven God doesn't exist, therefore God exists. You notice, at this point you should be saying, well, there's a big problem here. Because um, we can reach the opposite conclusions using the same argument. Now, what's the mistake here? Is science the sort of thing that's actually relevant to whether God exists or not? I mean, think about traditional conceptions of God. Not, not some, you know, like, God as an alien force or, or things like that. But God as, uh, you know, traditional Jews, Christians, Muslims conceive of him or it as something transcendent to the world, creative of everything, um, omniscient, omnipotent, all those, those other things. Okay, is that the sort of thing that, that you would be able to observe using the means, instruments, uh, etc. of science? No, because science has to do with the phenomenal world. Science has to do with the world we can observe and measure. And if you can't observe and measure it, then science isn't able to work with it. Actually, there's a lot of things within this world, this physical world, that science is not equipped to handle. Um, that's why psychology is such an inexact science. Uh, because when you actually get down to it, the stuff that you can measure is usually not very important, and the stuff that you can measure, or the stuff that you can't measure, turns out to be really central, right? Um, measure my love for, for my kids. Kind of tough to do, isn't it? Um, you can make a questionnaire, but that doesn't actually get at very much. Now, the, ca the, the mistake that's being made here is kind of a, a category mistake. They're thinking of science as the sort of thing that actually could prove it one way or another. So there's another mistake built into this. Um, could it be that, that um, God's existence is something that would have to be demonstrated in other ways through philosophical, theological arguments or through some sort of experience? Yeah, that's what we do in philosophy and religion classes um, or in uh, uh, theology classes. We don't teach any theology classes here, though. So. Both of these are good for thinking and remembering the argument from ignorance. When you see something like this, somebody saying, well, you haven't proven that something is the case, so therefore it's not the case, or you, haven't, you don't know that something isn't the case, therefore it is, you've got an argument from ignorance. Um, this also happens in personal life, too, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. When people suspect each other, um, you're cheating on me. How do, how do you know? Bless you. Uh, well, you haven't proven that you're not cheating on me. You know, you haven't shown me that you're not cheating on me. Or I don't know that you're not cheating on me, so therefore you are. The people fall into that, don't they? You may have had some friends who are insanely jealous like that. Um, or you could have the opposite. Think about people who are, are um, unwilling to face the facts. Um, well, you haven't proven that, that he is cheating on, on me, so um, therefore he's not. Well, you know, let's say, you know, a guy comes home uh, and uh, he's got a pair of underwear in his pocket um, and uh, lipstick on his collar, smells like perfume, uh, what else should we throw in there? He's got, a, he's got uh, somebody's uh, business card tucked oh, into there with, with a phone number written on the back and, and call me with a big heart on it. Um, anything else we should put in there? 
<laughs> okay, that's good enough. So uh, now he comes in, and uh, his, his wife, girlfriend, you know, fiance, whatever, says, I think you're cheating him. He says, well, you haven't proven it yet, therefore I'm not. He's making the argument from ignorance, right? Um, so you see this, this plays out in a lot of different ways. Um, now, the next fallacy is something a little bit different. Um, and this one's called begging the question. And like I mentioned, um, this term, this phrase, gets misused in our contemporary culture. I've seen it actually, I've seen quite well-educated people misusing this, this term. When you say that somebody's begging the question, you're referring to a certain structure of the argument. Where base, here's the basic form to it. Um, P, therefore, P. Now, what is that? That's just asserting the same thing or doing kind of a circular argument. Um, how is it that anybody can get fooled by this? Well, we'll, we'll go into that in, in just a moment. Because um, it's never so simple as just saying, uh, the dog has escaped because the dog has escaped. You know? um, instead, there will be some, some complicated things. Oftentimes, in the media, people will say that somebody's begging the question when they mean that they're making a questionable assumption. So... Well, people say, I beg to differ. Oh, I beg to differ? No, that's something different. I beg to differ is a polite way of saying, I think that you're wrong. Because... You know? uh, I don't, you know, this is kind of a digression. A lot of people are afraid to tell other people straight out, I think you're wrong. And you can say it in nice ways. You don't have to say it to somebody like, uh, well, I think you're full of crap. You know, uh, that's, that's a mean way to do it, right? Saying to somebody, I think you're wrong, is, um, is tough to do for a lot of people in our culture, uh, in part because uh, we tend not to distinguish between thinking that a person is wrong about something and thinking that a person is a bad person. We often associate criticism with um, a sort of judgmentalism, don't we? So, and you know, you're, I think your, your elementary and middle and high school teachers, in a lot of cases, probably didn't do you any favors by telling you, don't be judgmental, you know, um, don't, you got to be nice. Don't tell people when you think that they're wrong. Uh, everybody's got their own opinions. You've got to respect people's opinions. I mean, critical thinking tells you, yeah, well, you, you have to be respectful to the person, but you don't have to respect their opinions. If their opinions are wrong, their opinions are wrong, and that's it. You know? and, and you're actually doing somebody a favor when you do it nicely. Again, not, not just saying, you're an idiot, and your, your beliefs are full of crap. Um, but if, if you tell somebody that they're wrong and they actually are wrong, you're doing them a favor, aren't you? Because you're giving them the opportunity to get themselves out of the state of partial ignorance that they're in, which is a bad thing. You, you know, you don't want them to be there. Um, so yeah, saying I beg to differ is a nice way to, to start on the path to saying, I think you're wrong about this. Um, Okay, now when you beg the question, there's two ways you can do it. One is you say the same thing twice, but you reword it. You rephrase it. I think that we should lower tuition. You could come up with all sorts of reasons, right? It would make the students happy. That would be the argument for popularity, though, wouldn't it? That would be a fallacy. I think we should lower tuition because... Um, it makes me feel bad to think about all those poor students spending their hard-earned money. That'd be arguing for pity, wouldn't it? Mm -hmm. um, now, what if we just sort of rephrase things? Can you think of any other ways to say lower tuition? Any other vocabulary that you might substitute in there? Some verbiage to throw at somebody. Make the tuition smaller. Yeah. Um, Okay. Reduce tuition. Let's go with the smaller thing. Well, we've got to change the word tuition, though. I mean, that's the thing. We've got to get, get away from the, the word tuition. But the make smaller. What are we making smaller? We're making the burden on students smaller. Because that's what tuition is, right? 
So I think that we should lower tuition. Why? Because we will make the cost burden on students smaller that way. Or we will reduce the cost burden on students. Now, what have we done there? We've just said the same thing twice. We should lower tuition because we should lower tuition. Um, that's begging the question. And you can do this, if you, if you have an extensive enough vocabulary, you can do this with pretty much any claim that you want to make. Um, Dr. Sadler should wear red ties every day. Um, why? Because, um, what's another word for red? Crimson. Crimson? Crimson. Crimson, okay. Boy, I'm not hearing well all today. <laughs> because, uh, crimson, uh, scarlet, and, uh, sure, rojo. No, we'll, make, we'll, make, we'll make the Spanish word into, into an English word, are um, good colors for him to wear. Again, all we did is say the same thing twice. We just rephrased it a little bit. Now that's one way to beg the question. The other way is where you actually have what we would call a circular argument. And in its most basic form, a circular argument is where you have um, Let's say B is the, the uh, conclusion. Normally in an argument, you have a, a, you know, premises and they lead to the conclusion, right? And the premises are something different than the conclusion. Problem with some arguments, if you don't accept the premises, remember we did this before in class, you can have another argument to support those premises. Sometimes though, what people do is they smuggle something that belongs in the conclusion into the premises. So you, in a case like that, it becomes circular because A is being used to support B, but the trouble is you have to assume B to be the case before A is going to be convincing. I'm going to give you a great example of this that people use in theological discussions. People will say things like, um, God exists. And instead of providing some sort of philosophical argument like, well, you know, look around, there's a whole created world, where did this come from, could it have come from, from nothing, well, nothing comes from nothing, therefore we have to trace, you know, back through all these causes and there must be some primal cause. That's a, that's a philosophical argument that, that Thomas Aquinas made. Um, that's actually pushing it back further and further and you could, you know, unpack it and that's, again, what we do in philosophy of religion. A lot of times when people say, God exists, well, why? Because the Bible says so. Right? Now, is that going to be convincing to somebody who's not already a believer, not just that God exists, but in a whole bunch of other assumptions? Probably not. I mean, that will work in certain communities, um, but that's because they're already making certain assumptions. One of those assumptions is that the Bible, if the Bible says something, then it's true, right? And what are they using usually to back that up? Well, who wrote the Bible? And I'm not writing everything down here, but um, who presumably is responsible for the, the Bible and its, its truthfulness? God! Right, because if it's just written by human beings, then, well, you know, human beings have a tendency to stretch the truth, and make up stuff, don't they? Yeah, I mean, think of, the, think of all the lies that we've told as, as kids. I don't know about you, but I told a lot of lies. I made up a lot of stuff, because, you know, that's the nature of children. Sometimes they're not responsible, because they have like, trouble the, the separating their imaginary world from the, the real world. And part of being an adult is being able to distinguish those, right? Um, okay, now, could it be true that God exists? Yeah. Could you come up with other arguments for God's existence, other premises? Sure. Um, could it be true that the Bible, well, we know that the Bible says that God exists because it's actually in the Bible. Could it be true that if something's in the Bible, it's, it's true? Sure. Um, could we produce arguments for that? Yeah, people have produced arguments for that. I mean, they may not be ultimately convincing to everybody, but you can do that. What's wrong with this is not the assertions themselves, it's the fact that there's a circular structure here. 
You're not actually proving anything. It's, you know, sort of like the chicken and the egg, right? First you have to have the chicken to get the egg, but you have to have the egg to get the chicken. This sort of thing will never actually get off the ground. So that's begging the question. What is it begging? It's begging for precisely what you put into the conclude, or what you put into the premises that you took from the conclusion. And if somebody doesn't already accept some of these premises, you're never actually going to get off the ground. Uh, let's say we put aside theological arguments. A lot of uh, political and policy arguments are, are based on that. What are some of the big issues that are out there right now we can make circular arguments about? What are people debating about? Healthcare. Okay, yeah. Um, and uh, the two sides are basically saying, if you really boiled their, their doctrines down, the one side that wants to have universal health care is saying everybody has a right to health care and we ought to do that. And the other side is saying um, something along the lines of it's going to cost too much, it's going to be inefficient, um, we should have a, a free market, right? Um, which of those sides do you want to make a circular argument? Everybody deserves health care. Okay. Um, we need universal. Well, let's say universal health care is a basic right. Um, this is something that people say, right? Universal health care is a basic right. Everybody deserves that. Um, everyone deserves come in, isn't it? Uh, for some of the people, it's, a, it's not an a, a issue about whether you should treat people or not. It's a question about who should be doing the treating. Should it be the government that's in charge of that? Should it be the, the, uh, the free market? You know, should people be allowed to choose or should they be put into one big plan? These are the sort of things that are being debated. Everyone deserves to be taken care of by the government. Um, Therefore, universal health care is a basic right, or go the other way. Here's another sign we're dealing with begging the question. You can take either one of these and use them to support each other, couldn't you? Because you're making the same basic assumptions. Universal health care is a basic right. If something is a basic right, then what are you saying? Well, somebody should provide it. And if it's, you know, if it's universal, if it's, and it's fundamental, um, who provides uh, most of our rights? Government, right. I mean, I don't make my own roads. I suppose I could if I bought a tract of land and uh, decided to develop it, you know. But it's usually the government that does that, isn't it? Um, who uh, educates uh, my children? Actually, that's kind of a, a misnomer because I have my kids in a parochial school. But for the most part, government does, right? Um, local and state and, and federal. Um, who protects us from... Uh, Enemies, foreign and domestic, you know, um, the military forces, and where'd those come from? The government, right? We don't, we don't get together and say, well, I think we need an army. Um, let's hire a bunch of people, like, like uh, some mercenaries, and they'll protect us. Well, we could, I suppose. I mean, the government would shut us down pretty quick if we did. But, yeah, so if you're saying that something is a basic right, and you're already assuming that, well, if something's a basic right, the government ought to provide it. You're, of course you're going to think this. And if you think that everyone deserves to be taken care of by the government, well, of course you're going to think this. It's a fairly circular argument. Could you provide um, reasons why everybody deserves to be taken care of by, by the government that don't depend on things like this? You probably could find some arguments, right? This argument by itself isn't going to do it. And what happens a lot in these political talk shows, 
also in op-ed pieces and in these political discussions, people make circular arguments. And circular arguments are great for convincing people that are already convinced. They're not very good for reaching your opponents. And if you think about the, the nature and the function of argument, why do we make arguments? Just to hear ourselves talk? Some of us like, probably like to make arguments just, you know, because we like to chatter and we like when people say, yay, good job, right? Um, but why do we really have to make arguments? When do you make arguments? When you're trying to prove something. When you're trying to prove something, and so who do you try to prove things to? Other people. Right, other people, but all other people? People you want people. to get something that you feel are important to. People who you feel are important, right? But if they already see things your way, do you make an argument to them? You just say, no, let's do, let's do this. You make arguments to people who don't already agree with you. And if you make circular arguments, you're already assuming some things that your audience won't find acceptable. And they will then, if they're, if they're on the ball, they will catch you and say, hey, you're begging the question. You're, you're assuming something that you're supposed to be arguing for in the first place. So those are the two fallacies for today. Um, we'll pick up with uh, some more fallacies. Yeah, you notice our, our list is getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Are you guys starting to see some connections between them?